morning once again wana sifiwe ala akbar at least you've responded because when i said the bona siwe you didn't eh? my name is kelvin Kerr. i'm the ceo of Ita agenda uh, it's a pleasure to actually have all of you uh, with us today for the launch of our report as well as the monitoring uh, tool for open contracting uh, which we've been able to uh, develop upon implementing the wet pickup uh, project, which was funded and supported by UNDP uh, Kenya under the SPICE uh, program. Before I go further, I would wish uh, to recognize the presence of our partners and donors. <coughs> So, ladies and gentlemen, it's my uh, pleasure to address you this uh, morning of the Wednesday, the 27th of January 2021. I wish to say thank you so much to the team Youth Agenda for ensuring that uh, we implement this project despite the challenges of COVID-19 that we faced. We started this project about uh, uh, end of July. Uh, it's a six months project supposed to end in uh, December, uh, but by the grace and you know, support from UNDP, we've been able to push it to this end. We had a number of uh, activities and also uh, targets that we were supposed to reach. We were supposed to engage some of you as that 
data collectors, uh, some of you as you know, uh, supporting us through uh, collecting information from the various stakeholders. We also had a chance to interview uh, people from the Nairobi County government, the procurement team, as well as the executive. And interestingly, towards the end in Christmas, we got confirmations to, <laughs> to interview uh, the, CA, uh, the CS for uh, finance, Kuru Yatan, actually confirmed when we had uh, closed uh, the process of gathering information. Uh, nevertheless, uh, we shared the questionnaire with him and probably it was submitted uh, to the consultant. I also want to say thanks to the consultant who is out today, unfortunately she could not come. She has a patient uh, at the hospital and that uh, yesterday the patient, uh, the case uh, became a bit serious and uh, she asked that she, uh, she could be allowed not to come uh, to this particular day. So please, if you don't uh, see her making a presentation, uh, just understand that uh, she has had a challenge. But she's with us and she's worked with us through the journey to actually develop a uh, Open contracting is not a new thing in the country. As you are aware, Kenya signed uh, itself into the you know, open contracting. And as we go forward, it will be a man, uh, uh, mandatory that you know all governments, county governments, begin to appreciate and follow the guidelines on open contracting. Youth Agenda, as you will be told much later, have got a program that advocates for you know, good governance uh, that includes justice, you know, transparency and accountability. And we are encouraging you as you've come here today as we launch this uh, very critical document that as you go back uh, to your respective organizations, as you go back, as you work with your uh, members of county assembly, uh, people in the executive, try to exercise uh, some of the recommendations and the guidelines that have come out uh, through this program. It will be the only way that we can measure the success uh, of this particular project. So many experiences came from Nairobi County, as will be explained later in the presentation. And these experiences are no different. They are the same as, you know, the, there was a story of a county uh, made a procurement of tea, or the two million something uh, supply of tea. <laughs> you know uh, somebody was supplying tea to the county, and you know the the cost was really exorbitant. We have had cases of the recent uh, beds that were being procured for COVID nineteen. Uh, you saw the quotations and the amounts of money that were being you know brought in the public, and sometimes even. A layman who does not understand procurement would actually ask pertinent questions. How did that really come uh, to pass? And interestingly, some of these things happen when we in the civil uh, civil society space just watch. And sometimes we even participate. You know. So as young people, uh, as we are here, also make a, a rallying call to you that whenever there is public participation for um, you know, a budget making process, Please, let's get ourselves involved. Uh, let us raise questions at the earliest point possible. Uh, there's a joke I once put uh, when I was making a presentation at a program run by Emerging Leaders Foundation that corruption starts at budget. They say, oh, we want to make a road. Uh, in that road, you say, okay, so this is the standard of the road that we want to make. Want to make. So this is the amount of money that we put. So who will do that business? Yeah. Uh, where will you get the, uh, the tar, for example? Where will you get the mara? Where will you get the, the hardcore? You know, so corruption actually starts at that point. So for you to guard corruption, then you have to be part of the process that begins at the budget making process, and then you track it all through to the implementation process. In the same uh, spirit, we also discovered that very few counties are implementing or uh, really adhering to what the constitution uh, calls upon, uh, establishing what we call the project development committees, you know, for development committees.
committees even during COVID-19 uh, the funds that were dispersed it was very uh, rare to hear of public participation for the divisions that were being made and this report has actually highlighted that for Nairobi for those of you who have visited other counties uh, the story is just the same uh, the guys were saying, I, I remember going to some meeting and they were saying that there was no time for uh, public participation because of COVID restrictions, we were not able to bring people together for a, a public gathering. And you know, there is technology. You can even use WhatsApp to gather this information. Now finally, as I wish to exit and uh, invite uh, uh, other speakers, there was a rallying call uh, to this process, that this being a very interesting uh, and something forthright that will take us forward towards achieving accountability and good governance, that we extend it to other counties, that we also extend it at the national level uh, in all departments. There's a request that probably we're putting before uh, UNDP and any other player that is here uh, to look into uh, supporting and, and putting their minds together. We've also created a good base for future referencing uh, in terms of programming and looking at how to even engage uh, the youth serving organizations and other partners in the process, uh, how to go about. There's a lot of challenge in getting information from uh, players in government. Uh, there was also a challenge in accessing members of county assembly I have not seen any of them here, though they were invited. These are experiences that we'll be willing to share, uh, even to other partners that will be interesting in, interested, interested in developing or implementing uh, such kind of, of programs. By and large, today is a wonderful day, and I want to thank you for coming in to uh, join us in beginning a journey towards open contracting in the country, towards free, uh, freeing ourselves from corruption and towards the journey of transparency, accountability, and good governance. With those few remarks, I wish to say thank you very much. So in future, we have your QL now, appreciate you as you. So we thank God. Uh, I want to take this opportunity to find out whether we have uh, Bwana Wainaina here. He has not arrived. So maybe he will uh, speak uh, later. Also, the CC for help, I've been told that it's not able to come. Somehow they have a retreat somewhere and the priorities have changed. Uh, we hope that in future we'll be able to catch them. And so uh, it's my pleasure then to welcome uh, uh, Julius, who will briefly give his remarks and, of course, invite uh, Joanne to make a presentation. This is Kikuja. Good morning once more. Let me also take the same privilege like the CEO and not use the, the podium, so to speak. And, and uh, just to introduce myself again, um, my name is Julius Coelho. Um, at UNDP, I work on the inclusive growth portfolio. Um, together with my colleague, John, who works on the governance side, we are part of the unit that is called governance and inclusive growth. And as you may have interrupted, and as, uh, as uh, Joan will explain later, that the UNDP has uh, three programmatic areas, or three strategic areas of focus, for which governance is one, inclusive growth is the other, and um, environment and recovery, energy and recovery, or resilience, is the other. However, um, within UNDP, we have made um, a very concerted, a very thoughtful and deliberate effort to ensure that uh, youth becomes part 
and parcel of our programmatic intervention, and youth is at the center, both from an empowerment perspective and also from an equity perspective. So addressing the challenges of youth from all the three dimensions of inclusion, which is capability, opportunity, and voice, then we have internally constituted what we're calling the Youth Working Group, for which I am also a member. Ideally, the members of the Youth Working Group, uh, which ensures that programmatic alignment is youth-centric, are mostly people who are youth in legal definition, but at the same time, people who are youth at heart. And, and so for those who are above 35, And um, there's nothing as more silly than when you talk about corruption. Uh, so I really want to be, I wanted to have a test for a bite of the cell and be at the center of the thing that really deprives us of all the integral things that we may want to seek when we want to empower and we want to provide equity, which really is, is corruption. So what has happened here is of interest to the wider uh, programmatic focus uh, for UNDP for that reason. And, and so I'm really, very, really, very happy to be part of this and to, 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 to follow this journey together with not only the youth agenda, but also other supporters. Otherwise, thank you very much. Giving you the honors to invite you are. Sure. So indeed, yes, um, everything happens very well when uh, women are at the helm, yeah? They say that women make good leaders because they can deliver. So let me <laughs> let me ask my colleague uh, Joan, who, on behalf of the UNDP leadership, will also uh, give the remarks from our resident representative. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much, and good morning, everyone. Uh, like I said before, my name is John Wong. I work at UNDP as a portfolio analyst under the governance unit. Like Julia said, at UNDP we have three divisions. One is in charge of environment issues, and then we have the governance issues which I work under, and Julia then leads the inclusive growth uh, wing. All of us work under two team leaders. One is in charge of the environmental a portfolio and then the other one is in charge of governance and inclusive growth after that then we have senior management whereby we have our uh, our uh, both who is in charge of programs and then now the senior most resident coordinator who is badawi uh walid and i'm here to represent him and with in that with that our uh, it's my pleasure to read his speech Corruption undermines human development for it diverts public resources away from provision of essential services. It also increases inequalities and hinders national and local economic de development by distorting markets for goods and services. It corrodes rule of law and deploys public and destroys public trust in government leaders and, um, and also other leaders. In line with the commitment enshrined in the UN Charter, which reaffirms our obligations to aspire towards the promotion of fundamental human rights, human dignity, and equal rights for men and women, UNDP works to improve governance 
and combat corruption as a core requirement for achieving sustainable development goals across the world. In Kenya, transformative governance is a strategic priority of UNDP country program, as is inclusive growth and structural transformation. Not to forget the resilience of communities to the development challenges that we face. UNDP looks at various aspects of governance, including building integrity, transparency, and accountability in the public sector and non-state sectors, and promoting human rights, basic needs, and service delivery under the banner of leaving no one behind. In recognition that the pandemic uh, is more than a health crisis, but also development crisis, and a governance crisis too, UNDP, as the head development agency of the United Nations, responded to support the country to prepare, respond, and recover. As we have been doing this, UNDP recognizes that transparency and accountability are the ingredients of effective preparedness, response, and recovery, and beyond. And in this regard, therefore, we repurposed some of our financial and technical resources to support Kenya to effectively combat COVID-19 and achieve the sustainable development goals that this country is known for, its remarkable contribution in their formulation. UNDP therefore established the Strengthening Public Accountability and Integrity System project, that is the SPICE project, which was catalytic funding to support public accountability and integrity system. Okay. Uh, UNDP therefore established the Strengthening Public Ac Accountability and Integrity System SPICE project, which, catalyt which with catalytic funding to support the state and non-state actors in the effort aimed in preventing and combating corruption for improved service delivery, inclusive growth, and transformative governance. This was done, done through the following. Strengthening policy and legal frameworks for countering and preventing corruption, enhancing capacity for oversight and coordination institutions for countering and preventing corruption, and finally, where this project falls under, increasing capacities and participation of civil society, faith-based organization, media, and private sector to inform public monitoring and uh, service delivery to promote public accountability. It is hoped that with this catalytic funding from UNDP, there will be a concerted resource mobilization effort to establish a larger program on anti-corruption that will bring together a wide range of stakeholders from national and county government, private sector, media, and civil society. The youth agenda under the SPICE project initiated the Wajibika project, which sought to promote transparency and accountability and public participation within the admis within the admission of COVID-19 emergency response funds at the Nairobi County government focuses, focusing on open contracting in Nairobi to determine the ease of access to procurement information. The assessment conducted employed a non-state monitoring approach that entailed both primary and secondary data collection and through informant interviews with policymakers, government representatives, and civil society, and also health workers and the, and the private sector representative, uh, uh, as well as a desk review on legal and policy uh, literature, reports, and frameworks were developed. The draft report was prepared and submitted to a public validation on 18th December. UNDP appreciates the leadership by national and county government in the fight uh, against the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, this includes the establishment of the COVID-19 emergency response funds through a directive 
by the president to mobilize resources for emergency response towards containing the spread, effective, and impact of COVID-19, the setting aside of supplementary budgets at the county level to fight the pandemic, as well as additional support received from Kenyans, uh, Kenyan individuals. Also the corporate entities and from development partners and other multinational, multinational institutions. In all these efforts, the importance and role of civil societies cannot be undermined, underestimated. The role of these important stakeholders is key enhancement of social accountability in Kenya. Youth Agenda, through a Jibika project, contributed largely on building the capacity of youth in social accountability with a focus on public procurement and uh, public resource resources expenditure monitoring, and also on independent budget analysis and social audits. Through the Wajibika project, relevant information was generated, building a credible evidence base. The assessment carried out highlighted that Nairobi County ranked highly in terms of top level guidance and law. However, from an implementation and engagement perspective, much work needs to be done. Recommendations and lesson learned will enhance transparency, accountability, and citizen involvement in procurement processes, and at the same time, provide guidance to civil societies working on open contracting and how to strengthen and enhance transparency and accountability. The monitoring toolkit that will be that will provide a basis for citizens, especially the youth, to understand the, and engage in open contracting monitoring, hence enable enhancing the level and standards of public service. With that, I conclude by congratulating, congratulating Youth Agenda on the occasion of the launch of the study report, as well as the open contracting monitoring toolkit. UNDP's commitment to working collaboratively with all stakeholders in the pursuit of transparency and accountability equally that taken together offers a pathway beyond recovery towards 2030 with the SDGs as our compass. Thank you. I also want to say thank you, uh, uh, Joanne and Julius, and officially appreciate you on behalf of the young people and the youth agenda for the support that you gave us to uh, deliver this project. Last year, about in December, we won an award from the SDGs Forum for championing SDGs uh, in the country. And one of the main reasons that made us actually uh, achieve that was our contribution in terms of uh, achieving good governance uh, through this Wajibika project. Uh, so this means that we need to take back to Walid and also to appreciate him for giving us and trusting us uh, with the resources to deliver this project. I mean, there were many probably who uh, submitted requests for support and partnership and we were favored, of course, through your processes to actually deliver this project. So we highly thank you and we thank the SPICE uh, uh, team, the Amkeni team and the entire uh, UNDP Kenya team. With uh, those remarks from UNDP, I would wish us that we move to the next uh, session of the program, which is to invite Edin, uh, Richard, <laughs> uh, Richard to take over and uh, make a presentation of what the youth agenda is and uh, about briefly about the white speaker project thereafter i think we'll go for break for tea come back uh peruse through the the report and then launch uh, the report i believe some of you have got copies on your tables please peruse through them as uh, as we as we discuss and also, Richard, you tell them the hashtags 
we are also on youtube live uh, currently as we speak and we ask you to share widely this because it's not only a nairobi uh, based uh, program as you heard from the speech from our lead that there is high chances that it's going to be implemented across the country thank you so much welcome richard Thank you very much. All right, um, for today, the hashtag we're going to be using is hashtag Wajibika KE. Wajibika is right over here. Wajibika KE. And also hashtag Involve Youth KE. All right, so any tweets you put out, any messages you put out on social media, kindly use the hashtag Wajibika KE and hashtag Involve Youth KE. We also have content from the youth agenda handle that is going to be shared. So you can retreat widely as you also use and push the two hashtags. All right, uh, very quickly, I'll take you through what the youth agenda does and why this program is actually quite important to us because it is at the core mandate of what youth agenda is for. Um, youth agenda mainly wants to amplify youth voices within the society because we realized as we keep on speaking about youth involvement the divide is quite clear that many young people are either dissociated or uninvolved in processes that deal with governance and their own well-being which is a ticking time bomb now there are many reasons why youth should be involved in processes within the society and governance and we only have 17 million that we're going to be sharing today so please bear with us we are only going to be sharing 17 million reasons why all right so <laughs> please bear with us all right um it is projected that we're going to have at least 1 billion youth in africa by the year 2060. so this is a projection about where the future is headed a lot of the people in africa are going to be the youth which is already the case right now but the projection is set to balloon even bigger now in kenya we only have the capacity to at least produce 200,000 jobs annually yet we have a working force of around a million youth who are coming straight from either technical universities tvet centers <coughs> universities ready to enter the workforce so the aim of having youth involved in processes is to ensure that we do not leave any youth behind in all these processes that we have. Currently, we have around an average of 14 million young people in Kenya who are considered to be in the youth bracket, according to the census report from the 2019 census. And this is a huge number because youth need to be involved in processes through and through. So youth agenda ensures that we create a just and inclusive and progressive society where youth are involved in all processes concerning their well-being, their governance, the economic statuses, and the rights that they have in the different parameters in society which includes gender peace and security now for the main purposes of what youth agenda does as we have mentioned as i have mentioned just before we ensure that we have imparted information to young people across the society so that we cater for the different parameters and aspects of their well-being we would like to approach it from a holistic perspective where youth get to be imparted not only with information but also with skills and this helps them even in partnering with different institutions and different um, facilities to ensure that their growth is tangible so youth agenda has um, three main pillars we have the governance uh, pillar we have peace and security and gender and we also have economic empowerment and under that we also have the knowledge pillar so the theory of change that we would advance because of where the journey is headed as far as youth are concerned in the future is that we need youth who are responsive to governance issues and we also need a government that is responsive to youth issues we advance interventions to, to ensure that there's engagement there's youth engagement in governance processes 
and also in the development process. Because if we have a responsive, inclusive and accountable government, and also a private sector that is responsive and inclusive to the youth, we are able to involve youth in processes, and this is going to advance the society and better people for future. Many young people are either uninformed, disillusioned, or dissent from governance processes and from the leadership in society. And we don't want young people who are only being used for political purposes and gain. Now, as we have mentioned that there's limited access to political, social, and economic opportunities, this has actually, it's very tangible right now in society. You can feel it, you can see it, and we all know where the problems lie. We all can point towards a shortcoming that we are well aware of with regards to how young people are sidelined in society. We do not want to continue with a disillusioned and disengaged youth. We need to move to a position where young people are involved in processes and that they are a dividend in society. Now, the programs that we carry out to impact youth directly are to ensure that at least there's youth inclusion, the youth have information, there's gender representation, and there's economic empowerment. Political empowerment is also the core mandate that we carry out as youth agenda because it is through this that we are able to impact change through policies and through direct engagement with government, government and stakeholders. Now, one of the key programs that we carry out with this is the active citizen, um, which ensures that at least citizens are involved in governance processes. We carry out social audits. We have engagement forums. We ensure that they are aware of the budgeting cycles, they are critiquing the government, they are able to also engage meaningfully during public participation processes. There's also a project we carried out in um, 2019, that's the Kenya Accountable and Inclusive Political Processes, KIPE, under the guidance and the donorship of NDI, and we, DAI, sorry, and we also have the Top 35 Under 35 program, which seeks to recognize young people who are exceptional in different fields in society. And we are proud to mention that we have, I believe it is three Top 35 Under 35 um, awardees from the 2020 cohort. Um, if you could just wait, we have Diana here. We, yes, please, here yeah, we have. And they will tell you that it is good to be recognized, isn't it? Does it feel good? <laughs> to win awards and to be recognized for the good work that you're doing. So we're trying to encourage young people to at least get the attention that they deserve and also get the opportunities that come with the excellent work that they're doing. And lastly is the Wajibika project that we are here to discuss and talk about today and launch the report. So I won't get much into it because that is coming up. The other pillar, economic empowerment. We carry out mentorship, we carry out an entrepreneurship program, and we also had the very first youth employment conference last year at the Kenya School of Gover Government, which is a program that we believe young people need to consistently learn about the opportunities that are available to them in society. Many of them have the ideas, some have the skills, some have already started working on what they would like to do to create employment and to create opportunities for other fellow young people. But the platforms that are there may not be sufficient in highlighting the opportunities that are available. So youth agenda through the economic empowerment pillar recognizes that we need mentorship for young people and we also need to link them with the readily available opportunities. The gender peace and security pillar, ensure that at least we have representation and we have a balance in society where people feel included in processes. And for those who feel they are not well represented, we try as much as possible to ensure that we have programs that amplify their voices and that we have key stakeholder engagements and multi-sectoral engagements with people in society to ensure that rep gender representation is something that we at least get to advance and influence with regards to policies, and also hoping that in due course, we will have tangible impact throughout society. 
Um, some of the programs that we've carried out in the, under this pillar is the Deliver for Good campaign, Kenya, which I'm sure some of you have heard about. Um, we also have um, evidence gathering and promotion of young women participation in the 2017 electoral processes. This is something that we still are going to push for uh, with regard especially to the upcoming elections next year because we, need, we definitely need more women. As Julius had mentioned, everything is okay when women are at the helm because they can deliver. And we also have increasing women participation and representation um, during, that was during the 2017 general elections. For youth agendas programs, we know that through devolution, we have an opportunity to impact not only from a national scale, but also at county level, because through the counties, we're able to implement and have more impact and reach towards the young people in the different sectors of this country. Youth Agenda has a, currently has a presence in 14 counties in Kenya. And through the 14 counties, we at least have impacted an average of around 600,000 young people to the different programs that we have. And this is mainly through our corporate members. Some of them are represented here. And through this platform, we know that we're able to grow. And the aim is to have membership representation across the 47 different counties. So we have only had the opportunity to get into 14 counties, but in time, we believe that we're going to get into all the, the 47 counties. Um, this is just a list of the member organizations that we have in the different counties. I'm not so sure whether it is quite legible, especially if you're at the back, but I'll just quickly read them. We have representation from Nyeri County, that's the Nyeri Youth Forum, Eshimwenyuli Youth Group in Kakamega, Youth United in Machakos, um, Isiolo Social and Accountability Group from Isiolo, Center for Transformational Leadership in Nakuru, Taita Taveta Resource Center, that's in Taita Taveta, Banana Youth Development Group in Garissa, Emerging Leaders Foundation in Nairobi, Youth for Sustainable Development in Kisumu, Kwale Youth and Governance Consortium in Kwale, uh, the Kenya Youth Muslim Alliance Mombasa, Nairobi County Youth Network in Nairobi, the Kericho Youth Center in Kericho, and Nandi Youth County Network. These are the uh, part of the member member organizations that we have, uh, the corporate members. We also have representation in Transoya County and also in Tarakanithi County, which we are trying to formalize and at least have the members come on board. And we are still open to partnership and membership inclusion with many different organizations across the counties. As we mentioned, we only have representation in now 14 counties officially, 16 with the two that have been onboarded, but the aim is to get to the 47 counties. The main aim why we're here today is because of the SPICE project that we have already, has already been mentioned earlier by the UNDP representatives and will be expounded upon by Edin based on the findings of the Wajibika project. And the main objective of the project was to at least promote prudent use of public resources and the compliance of the PFM legal frameworks. We all were in APRO when we watched the COVID millionaires expose, weren't we? Or you were part of the beneficiaries. You know, it's either <laughs> you're either a beneficiary or you are also part of the people who are in APRO and are watching it and wondering how is it that the country is going through a pandemic and we still have people who are benefiting from a pandemic. So the main aim was to at least ensure that we promote prudent use of public funds based on the legal frameworks that are available to us. And the expected result was at least that we would have improved access to information on the COVID-19 response and county procurement processes, improved accountability in the administration of the COVID-19 response funds, and also the adherence to the PFM legal frameworks. Um, Edwin is going to expound more on that after the tea break, so we won't bore you with a lot of information right now. But the main activities that were carried out is um, we trained and equipped uh, young members of county assembly, um, youth serving organizations and youth who had the knowledge and skills to at least learn on open contracting and understand what it entails. There was also assess, we assessed the level of open contracting in the county during the COVID-19 period. And we also had the COVID-19 response fund independent analysis and impact assessment. 
the, we tracked the county's compliance with the PFM legal frameworks, and lastly, we had follow-up advocacy with the different partners and stakeholders within the county. That is it for the presentation. Thank you very much for listening to us. Um, we are going to take a short tea break, but before we do that, we have a guest who has arrived who at least I will allow Kelvin to introduce before they make their opening remarks. Thank you very much. Please grab your tea properly. <laughs> yeah, uh, thank you for taking us through what the agenda does. And uh, members, please, I beg your indulgence that we allow our senior to uh, make his uh, uh, brief remarks. Then we can go to uh, So Inaina works for Nairobi County Government and is a key uh, partner, stakeholder in the implementation of this project. I'm not sure whether you ever met uh, Joan from the uh, We can do that at uh, t -Bay. So maybe just minutes for you to make your Thank you, Kelvin, uh, and uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Wainaina, um, as the form. Uh, I work with the Nairobi County Government. As the acting uh, director of Youth Appeal, and um, I'll be very brief. Very, I think uh, probably the other time to engage. Um, and we've been part of this process, I think, from the onset uh, when the, I think the, the survey or uh, the launch of this project was started. Uh, we've been part of the, the validation. Um, I think I've seen the county has also been part of the even the survey and the key informant. Uh, specifically, I think the research was meant to uh, look at how COVID funds uh, have been spent uh, within Nairobi County. And we are grateful that we also part of the launch of the report. And uh, I think on behalf of the county government and uh, specifically uh, the sector that I represent, uh, we look forward um, to the recommendations. Uh, I've seen a bit of that uh, uh, in the report itself. And what the county uh, uh, will be uh, is expected to, to do, and also the assembly. Uh, I, I think the last time we had members of the, uh, because they're also uh, very important in terms of the uh, legislation and uh, allocation of budgets to see how we can implement uh, some of the conditions. So with those very few remarks, uh, I want to give up the mic to uh, care and uh, look forward to engage more as, as we continue today. Thank you.
Okay, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Eddie Nusen. I'm going to take you through uh, an overview of the project and uh, an analysis of the finding. And uh, I hope it's going to be an, uh, a very interactive uh, engagement because uh, the findings of, uh, of this study is what you interact with uh, on a daily basis because uh, you understand as much as we have COVID-19, corruption is still a pandemic in uh, this 
country that uh, we are ranked 138 nationally uh, globally in terms of uh, our corruption index and every now and then we get to realize uh, the extent to which uh, uh, public funds are being and being, are being embezzled or misused uh, so uh, with the project Wajibika, Wajibika is a trade word which means uh, to be accountable. Uh, specifically, the project aimed at uh, promoting prudent uh, use of public resources and uh, compliance with the PFM uh, eco framework. This is in response to the COVID-19 funds. We only focused on COVID-19 funds in Nairobi County because we understood that uh, uh, if we start engaging on uh, use of public funds in all sectors. That is going to be a very big uh, project and it's going to involve uh, different stakeholders. So we decided to pick a small component in the bigger overview of corruption. Uh, so our main aim was also to promote transparency and accountability in COVID-19 investments. And uh, as one of the speakers earlier uh, stated that everyone was up in arms when uh, we when the COVID-19 millionaires exposed the thing done. And uh, as youths, as Janas, we know that uh, our main uh, space of uh, air in our grievances is on Twitter, Facebook, and, uh, and uh, Instagram. Not to be sana. See you. To sana. If we complain on, uh, on the social media about COVID-19 millionaires, then after that, So it's our nature as, as youths that uh, when we engage, we engage on social media, we trend on social media, then after, after that, that is all. So our engagement on Wajibika was not only to uh, build the capacity, but also to engage youths as a forefront in championing uh, issues of uh, prudent use of public resources, especially in COVID-19 funds and uh, engage Nairobi County government in ensuring open uh, contracting when they are doing uh, procurement. We understand that most of uh, uh, the corruption cases usually happen at the procurement stage. Is that true? Is it true that most of procurement, in, uh, most, most of the corruption cases in government happens at the procurement stage? From the first case of the from the first identified case of corruption, that was in 1965, of a May scandal, not the, the recent May scandal, we had the first corruption case of the May scandal by uh, a minister called Paul, Paul, Paul Gage, who awarded a tender to his wife. So it happens at the procurement phase. So our main objective was to engage the procurement department to ensure that there's transparency of information, there's transparency of uh, uh, documentation on procurement so that we as citizens can engage our democratic rights in uh, uh, ensuring and monitoring uh, these uh, funds. So what is this open, uh, open contracting that we're talking about? And I'm happy today we are going to have another session on uh, the open uh, contracting platform that was done for Makwini County. Uh, the presentation is going to be done by uh, the developers of, the, of that platform, and they are going to tell us in detail what open contracting is and how it contributes towards transparency and accountability. So open contracting basically aims at, uh, at improving procurement in three phases. By one, disclosure of information, that the crucial information that you need as a citizen to understand what's going on and how your funds are being utilized can be disclosed and the engagement and participation of different stakeholders, be it citizens as the guys who want to bid for, uh, for uh, proposals uh, at the government level or as a citizen who wants to exercise his or a democratic right in ensuring that his funds are properly utilized. All these in a bit to ensuring that accountability is addressed. That we as citizens can have a mechanism where we, in case we have a complaint, it's easily picked up by the government and worked on. So open procurement basically looks at those key uh, uh, components. That one, disclosure. Two, the engagement and participation of the key stakeholders. And three, a uh, redress mechanism toward, towards addressing any complaint. So 
for this project, we were mainly focusing on Nairobi County and we had three main objectives. That one, we wanted to document the current levels of uh, open contracting, basically in Nairobi County with the response to COVID-19 uh, fund. And two, improve accountability and administration of COVID-19 uh, response fund. And three, share our recommendations and strengthen uh, open uh, contracting in Nairobi County. So with those three main objectives, we engage in a study that uh, uh, approach different stakeholders at the government level, at, at, uh, at, uh, at private level, as, as youth and as citizens of Nairobi, to come up with that report that you have on the table, and also sharing our recommendation and creating that advocacy that we need so that uh, we can have a transparent system where, as a citizen anywhere, you can be able to check how the government is uh, using the process of open contracting to ensure openness and uh, accountability. So the study employed both a uh, uh, primary data collection system and a uh, secondary data collection system. So for primary, we, we developed uh, uh, data collection tools, mostly key informant interviews uh, for government uh, stakeholders. And we also developed uh, a questionnaire for citizen perception. And we work in all sub-counties and wards in Nairobi County, collecting the perception of citizens towards how Nairobi County has performed in responding to COVID-19. So we interviewed government representatives, civil society organizations, uh, health workers, private sector representatives. And we also did a desk review of the legislative and policy uh, framework that are available in the country. So this was not done as, uh, by, by youth agenda alone, but also with support from uh, uh, youths from uh, different youth serving organizations. And I'm happy to recognize that most of them are, are with us in this uh, room. And later on, I'm going to give them uh, a few seconds also to give uh, us the experience when they, are, they were gathering this information. So an overview of the Wajibika project, because the report that we are launching today is only a component of the bigger project. So the project also uh, trained uh, young MCS from Nairobi County, and I remember uh, Mr. Wanena was with us on the first uh, training session that we had on open contracting, and we engaged about 10 uh, youth MCS and uh, about 30 or, 30 or 40 uh, youths from the youth serving organization and other key stakeholders. And uh, in that meeting, we had uh, the CEC of Health. Uh, before that, uh, he hadn't been moved to uh, the NMS. He was still uh, under the Nairobi County government before his department was now moved to uh, NMS. So we have his full support, and uh, he was really engaged in this process of uh, uh, understanding how Nairobi County is faring in terms of open contracting. So we established an open contracting uh, monitoring committee which comprises of youth serving organization and we did an analysis of Nairobi County in terms of uh, its procurement processes on uh, COVID-19 and we did a citizen perception survey of which we identified another key uh, 17 uh, sub-county data collected from uh, uh, all the 17 administrative uh, sub-counties that we have in Nairobi who engaged in a uh, citizen perception by working in different words and getting the perception of citizens. So I'm also happy to note that some of them are with us. Uh, I'm going to give them a few also seconds to tell us what of their experience. So after that, we did uh, a key informant interviews and uh, those the citizens and we did a desk review of legal and policy reports and frameworks. So from that, we had some few challenges, uh, being a study and uh, Having some key people that we want to talk to, it was a bit challenge to get some because most of them have their own busy schedules. Uh, so we were not able to get uh, key stakeholders like the auditor general. But as Kea noted earlier, that we, our letter from uh, the CS uh, Treasury was responded to, and we also got a chance also to interview him. So at the end of uh, our, our, when we are doing now the report. So uh, it's good that you know that we also engage uh, the government at the national level. So we also had issues to do with access of information. But this is a, a challenge that when you want to get information from the government, sometimes it becomes a bit difficult. That one, maybe the time that you need that information, you 
provided uh, timely information or to the information is not there or the information is not updated or they don't want to give you that information. So it's the challenge that we encountered access to information, uh, our most of our information were not responded to in time and some of them were not even, uh, uh, responded to at all. So the study findings. So our study was based on three aspects. We wanted to understand the, uh, the structural framework that are available in Nairobi counties to enhance open consulting. We wanted to understand the technical uh, overview of Nairobi County, uh, the policies that are there at the national and the county level that will enhance open consulting. And further to this, we wanted to get the feel of what the citizens, what the common monarchies are saying towards uh, Nairobi's performance on a uh, uh, COVID-19 response fund. So for institutional arrangement, we understand that the PPRA, Public Procurement Revenue Authority, exists, and it was developed and mandated to ensure that uh, uh, issues regarding open contracting are, are put in the frame at the different county levels and at the national level. But Amidst all the, 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 the policies and the legal frameworks that are available, we continue. Uh, one, one person, uh, there is a guy who said that uh, in Kenya, we have abundance, abundance of uh, policies, very good policies that can be adopted in any country, very good uh, policies that can be applied. But our main challenge is usually the implementation of those policies. Uh, Secondly, we noted that uh, the di disruption between, I can't call it disruption, let me put it uh, in another word, maybe uh, the change of function from Nairobi County to NMS uh, hindered most of our, our work because uh, there was no that coordination between uh, uh, Nairobi County and uh, the NMS as an entity. That now, we started working uh, on Wajibika when uh, the health department was under NCC. Then when we are in uh, the data collection process, the uh, health department is moved to a different entity that is NMS. Now we have to start all over again in terms of seeking approval from uh, NMS to carry out this study, getting the relevant people to respond to us under the NMS. So it created that uh, uh, challenge towards uh, getting information and getting information on the institutional arrangement. So what we know that is uh, NMS is going to be with us for maybe one year. What we are not sure of is the entity will be there after 2022. But as, a, as, a, as, a, as an organization, if we are going to have NMS as an entity, then we need to have a well-coordinated and structural approach to it. That if NMS is coordinating its activities as an entity, then it should have its own policies and uh, framework to work along with. The other thing we noted is that the ICT basically, the skill, the skill basically among uh, senior, senior government leaders and civil society, uh, civil servants, Latin. The reason for this is that uh, I'm sorry to say most of our civil servants are in uh, the upper, upper limit age maybe about 50 years and about senior. And most of them lack that technological trend that we as, as, as youth have. So uh, giving them uh, the, the skills and ICT is a, requirement, is, is, a, is a necessity to them so that they can be able to uh, apply open contracting in a better way because open contracting relies mo mostly on digital platforms and the government as it is right now, most of the things are manual. Right now is when we are trying to move from that manual system to a digital system. In terms of uh, the process on, on procurement, it's very clear for uh, the government officials that uh, uh, this is the process that needs to be followed in terms of uh, uh, getting, uh, putting out any procurement. But and, uh, despite of having that knowledge and uh, uh, that uh, knowledge of how the process is sometimes maybe due to bad intention uh, the information is not disclosed or the information is not there or there's a large there's a, uh, a big challenge in oversight uh, in terms of quality of goods and services uh, we noted that uh, some of the, the COVID-19 uh, procured items by Nairobi County was not 
of good uh, quality. We fully didn't get, in, get more information on this because uh, uh, the persons responsible to this did not uh, answer to our letters. We wanted to get uh, information in terms of uh, uh, the hand washing point that were installed in different uh, sub counties, but we are not able to get the information. In terms of legal framework, as I said earlier, Kenya, we are very good in terms of legal framework. We have policies that are in place. Uh, the Anti-Corruption and Economic Act of 2003, the Public of Service Act of 2003, uh, Public Procurement and Disposal Act of 2005, Proceeds of Crime and Anti-Money -Man Anti Laundering Act of 2009, PFM Act, County Government Act. These are some of the examples of the acts and uh, the legal frameworks and policies that we have in place. But despite of having these good uh, policy infrastructure, we continue seeing uh, uh, corruption cases at the procurement level. Uh, the law requires the publication of procurement plans, tender notice, meeting documents, award notice, but what we, not, we noted at the Nairobi County is some of the information or publication are put out, some are outdated, but we couldn't get a good infrastructure of information as compared to what Makwini County, for example, Makwini County is being under I and Leo Marakwet is being on a, on a small scale. So Makweni County is a very good example of how to uh, apply and uh, use open contracting. And uh, my colleague, uh, the next presentation is going to show us that in detail. Uh, there are no uh, new laws and regulations to offer proc uh, procurement guidance during pandemic. COVID-19 hit, hit most of uh, the countries and non, uh, most of uh, the governments I didn't like prepare themselves for COVID-19 because it's a pandemic. So uh, in terms of procurement during a pandemic or an emergency period, we didn't have any goals or any regulations that were there that this is the procedure that needs to be followed uh, by the procurement department when, when uh, for example, purchasing uh, uh, the PPE or the face mask or uh, the sanitizers. So uh, we didn't have any policies or, or any regulations that were in place to enforce uh, uh, during the pandemic. So in terms of uh, transparency, there was existing, uh, the procurement laws are there, they are existing, uh, but the challenge is the disclosure of information, especially at the procurement level. In terms of citizen perception, uh, we, at, at, the, at the county level, uh, we found out that uh, citizen perception or uh, citizen participation wasn't uh, uh, enforced. There was no public participation to discuss how the COVID-19 uh, funds are going to be implemented. Uh, this, is also, this is also a finding that we, we, we noted from uh, the citizen perception that most citizens were eagerly waiting to be engaged in terms of how the county is going to respond uh, uh, on COVID-19. As much as it's a health crisis, it created that economic disruption that most households were suffering uh, in terms of uh, loss of jobs, loss of income, reduced income, and they wanted the county to respond in a different way as compared to what, uh, how the county responded. So they wanted to air out those uh, uh, information, but there was no platform as much as the constitution is there to give them that democratic power that they are going to exercise their democratic right through citizen uh, uh, public participation. In terms of future laws, uh, right now uh, uh, we have uh, the Public Procurement and Asset Disposal Act of uh, 2015 that is in force, uh, that obligates county officers to ensure that the procurement of goods, work, uh, works, and services is done transparently and with strict adherence to approved procurement plans. Uh, for policy context analysis very uh, quickly, uh, we have uh, the strategic plans that create enabling environment for advocacy around open contracting in the country. Uh, the most dominant one is the executive, uh, the president executive order of uh, number two of 2018 on, on procurement of public goods. But from the study we noted that there is also that uh, political goodwill to apply some of uh, 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 the policies that a governor like uh, that of Makwini, Professor Kibuza Kibwana, has been consist consistently uh, implementing uh, open contracting in his own country, uh, in his own county, and uh, Elgeo Marathoti is also doing the same. But 
if Nairobi County had that good will in terms of access to information and giving out information of, uh, on public procurement, then they need to be able to get to that level and engage the citizens on developing a platform where information can be on your, finger, uh, on your fingertips. There's key data owning agencies that have expre uh, expressed public uh, visible support to open contracting or both broader open data issues. Youth agenda being one of them that we advocate uh, governments to ensure that uh, if there is need for accountability, they need to put it in action by taking up uh, open uh, contracting platform and being able to implement it, uh, implement it and give uh, updated information. That having a system alone uh, will not suffice. You need to regularly update the system with the information that the citizens require. On COVID-19 response fund, what we noted is that uh, uh, first the objective was to review the five procurement phases uh, were done by the Nairobi County. Was there ease of access to information on pro procurement, uh, the level of disclosure of information, and we further will, the analysis hope to determine the openness, transparency, and value for money. Uh, on that, we noted that uh, Nairobi County has received about one billion in terms of uh, COVID-19 response fund, but the challenge and uh, the challenge we experience is getting to know how the money was utilized. That as much as uh, they received the different amount from uh, the, uh, the, the, the exchequer, from the national government, uh, from the county health workers allowances. We were not sure on how the money was declared. I mean, getting that information was uh, really difficult for us. We found that there is a, a lot of missing information in terms of uh, the tender awarded, who was awarded that tender, the amounts of uh, money that was awarded to that tender or contract. So these are the challenges that uh, uh, hinder citizens' participation towards uh, tracking what the council government is in terms of uh, uh, the public resources and they give a good environment towards a, a favorable, favorable environment towards uh, corruption. That there were 49 tenders that were awarded by Nairobi County during the COVID 19 period, and most of them were restricted tenders. And the reason for this, the reason given for this was it was because uh, COVID 19 was an emergency and they needed to respond as quick as possible. As, as, as an institution that is advocating for openness and transparency, we like a county government that is quick in responding. But as much as it's quick to respond, they should not be, it should not be a reason to flout the process uh, that are placed there. That if this is the uh, PFM Act provides the uh, uh, channels towards ensuring the uh, clear uh, procurement process, then it's the responsibility of the government, uh, the government or the county government, acting towards ensuring that process is followed, even if it's an emergency. So, what you noted that all the tenders that were advertised were for personal protective equipment, temperature scanners, and uh, sanitization materials. When we were doing this study, we also, you, when, when, when we were doing a, a study on account, you also get to stumble upon information from other counties. And we noted that there's a county that uh, bought hand washing materials at a price of uh, 10,000 per each hand washing material. And the hand washing material basically is uh, the 20 liter jerry can come to this in Nigeria and, uh, and a small tub. So put it, uh, just give it a rare image of that come to the 20 liter jerry can and a small tub installed on it. Does it cost 10,000 really? Does it? So these are some of the things that we as citizens need to not only complain on Twitter, but also take action by engaging the relevant uh, government institutions towards ensuring that the money are being used appropriately. So there's also the issue of timely public, uh, publication of tender information. That the, uh, the law provides a, a period of uh, 14 days for a tender to be released, uh, you are uh, inquiring on any information regarding the tender, submission of the tender, that period of 14 days has to be applied. But 
what we noted for uh, Nairobi County was a tender was open and closed within a, a period of seven days. So it didn't give someone a chance, maybe in Embakasi, in Kasarani, who's interested in this, to one, get the information, two, act on the information or even apply on the tender, and three, employ more information about the tender. So the period was too short for any citizen to engage effectively. So the eligibility of the tender was also a major issue that most of the tenders, as much as any person can be able to apply and work with the government, most of the tenders were restricted. And uh, we sought information on why this information, uh, why these tenders were restricted. And you are told it's because it's an emergency and uh, they needed these things as quick as possible. But my question to you, as a youth, can you not be able to supply face masks, uh, face masks to the government? Do you need any health qualification to supply that? So, in conclusion, that Nairobi County lacks the capacity to implement open contracting unless us as a CSOs and other like-minded CSOs come together to uh, capacity build the Nairobi County in terms of uh, implementing open contracting. That it's upon us as citizens to engage the Nairobi County to be able to implement open contracting because it's for our own good that we need to know how the money has been used and to reduce the, uh, the, 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 the cases of corruption that we see. Uh, the government, uh, sorry, the president uh, recently on a local radio station said that we are losing how much per day? Two billion per day. So you can just imagine the amount of uh, money we are losing through uh, irregular procurement and tenders. And we need to do something as citizens. There is inadequate procurement information disclosure. Uh, there is lack of capacity and, and understanding uh, among uh, the open contract uh, among the CSOs on open contracting. So, in, in the bid to respond to uh, the lack of capacity, the lack of capacity among the CSOs, we developed the open open um, uh, to, to enable any any CSO or any paid organization that wants to engage on uh, open contracting in any county to be able to apply and implement the guidelines and also be able to engage any county government in terms of uh, application of open uh, contracting. There is lack of public awareness and demand for open contracting. If the citizens are not aware that it is their responsibility to engage with the county government or the national government on issues of open contracting. So, apart from this, uh, we also did a citizen perception study where we engage the different uh, citizens in Nairobi County at the different world levels, different sub-county levels, to also get their views and feel of how they rate uh, the county in terms of uh, uh, they are responsible for the But before that, I'd like to give some few uh, minutes to uh, the monitoring committee uh, that supported us in getting this information and uh, collecting the primary data, doing this reviews on uh, the policies and uh, the different frameworks that are available for, uh, uh, at, the, at the national county level. So I want to give them a chance quickly and to tell us their experiences. Uh, Richard, help me. So, uh, Bukimburu and the team, whoever wants to start first, can go. Just your experience on how it was, uh, the challenges you experienced in terms of collecting the data. Uh, the team, the monitoring committee team, is not in the Evans. Okay, so uh, I can see Martin. Martin, can you just see an overview of Martin? How, what was the experience?
basically uh, uh, the percentage uh, collected in each county. Uh, we factored in uh, those counties that have a uh, high population. That's why we have 7% in some of the counties and 6% in some of the counties. But generally, we wanted to collect an equal number in each of uh, the sub-counties. So in terms of gender seg uh, segregation, we have uh, we had more likely 50-50%, uh, but the males were generally for 9.5. And the females fifty In terms of age, the highest category was at uh, six to forty years, at twenty percent. Uh, the youth category we had a majority, sixteen percent of five point nine percent at eighteen to twenty, and uh, sixteen point one, sixteen point eight, and fourteen point seven percent. We also had uh, uh, the older generation above seventy years at zero point three percent because. It, it's an inclusive study, and we also wanted to get uh, the approval towards how the county is responding to uh, COVID-19 because COVID-19 usually hits the, the, the 56, 50 years and above, uh, uh, mostly in terms of health issues. So uh, the first key uh, issue we wanted to understand from them is where to include the information uh, related to COVID-19. And uh, the national government was noted as the, major, uh, the main source of information at 76%. We had other, other, other institutions like uh, the county government, community-based organizations, religious institutions, other sources, and uh, NGOs uh, having a lower percent. But you and me can attest to it that the national government played a critical role in terms of uh, creating awareness around COVID-19. Ata, ata nyanyangu huko nyumbani ya likuwa nangoja saa kisa kwa mutai to announce uh, to give his press statement. And uh, every kid around the block ya likuwa nangoja if you behave abnormally, what happens? If you behave normally, yeah. And I, I know wale bijana wa music kwa mtengeneza ngoma na. So in terms of frequency, information what we noted is that uh, most most uh, the, uh, most uh, Nairobi citizens uh, uh, say that uh, the information that they have been given by the government is very adequate and adequate uh, adequate at 56 percent and uh, very adequate at 23 percent a very minimal percent uh, percentage still uh, that uh, they haven't received any information before. In terms of general knowledge and awareness around curbing the spread of the virus, uh, the study noted that most of the citizens are very aware on how, uh, on what uh, health protocols and guidelines they need to follow in terms of uh, curbing the spread of the virus, washing hands, wearing face masks, uh, all the guidelines that were there provided by the health ministry. Uh, it's good to note that most of the citizens who are very informed and are very well informed and informed around uh, this protocol and guidance. In terms of impacts on COVID-19 in the life of citizens, what you noted that 
as much as uh, COVID-19 was a health crisis, it created a very uh, big economic challenge. 72% uh, of uh, the respondents we interviewed said that there was a reduction, there was a reduction in their income. 51% uh, noted that they lost their jobs during uh, the 2020 uh, pandemic period. And all this created a strain on household resources. But uh, the, the households that uh, were mis mainly depending on an income, then the income has been removed. They have to, depend, they have to create other coping strategies towards, uh, uh, towards uh, sustaining, and, uh, sustaining themselves during the, uh, the period. In terms of the, the response on, uh, of uh, Nairobi County and COVID-19, uh, I can say they performed uh, this money because uh, from the assessment, uh, only 63% said that the Nairobi County has uh, performed well in terms of provision of information on, on protection of COVID-19. Generally, uh, uh, awareness creation and sensitization uh, in terms of uh, establishing hand, hand, hand washing points, 51% said that uh, the county has uh, done uh, well in terms of establishing hand, hand washing points. In terms of limitation of public spaces, 45% uh, said that they noted the county feeling that, percent And the important role of provision of PPE is to help facilities. Only 23% of the citizens stated that they noted uh, county government, Nairobi county government uh, providing PPEs to help facilities. In terms of financial material support, because uh, COVID-19 response fund was not only meant to respond to uh, the virus, uh, the, the spread of the virus through uh, health facility, but, but also to caution uh, the citizens in terms of providing them with financial package uh, or uh, material package to be able to uh, be resilient during the pandemic period. So, only 4% said that they have ever received any financial support from the county government in terms of uh, responding to COVID-19. Uh, only 2% said that they have received any material support. Only 5% said that they are any, a member within the household received that uh, financial support. And 3% in terms of uh, a member receiving a material support. Uh, sub county is the highest number of citizens who have received uh, financial services in Bakasi North and uh, uh, in Bakasi is performed uh, at least well in terms of uh, the sub county where citizens uh, reported to have received uh, financial uh, services. And uh, Elvis from uh, KYMCA, uh, KYPA told me that uh, maybe because uh, in Bakasi North uh, uh, or in Bakasi, if one of them has a uh, uh, double winner at the end. So we are here to confirm that, but team uh, coming from KYPA. So, uh, sub counties with the highest number of citizens who have received material support are Waraka at 21%, uh, Kamukunji at 17%. Uh, in terms of, we are talking about this material support, but we wanted to know what material supports have they received. So, 61% uh, said that they received face masks and uh, sanitizer, 31% said they received food, salt, and other household materials. And 8% said that we received other materials, which included uh, things like soaps and, uh, and uh, uh, sanitary towels and uh, sanitary food package. So we wanted to understand their perception regarding what the, the county's uh, preparedness to COVID-19. And we asked them for, uh, about uh, uh, hosted, uh, five statements. Number one, we want to know, the Nairobi, uh, Nairobi County have does Nairobi County have a strong pandemic uh, preparedness, uh, preparedness team that includes public health and medical experts to manage a response to a pandemic? And we, what we noted from that segment is 49% uh, disagreed, say that Nairobi County doesn't have uh, a strong pandemic uh, preparedness. In terms of Nairobi County having uh, provided everyone with access to free, reliable COVID-19 testing, 50% uh, uh, of the citizens of the intermediate said no, they disagree that the Nairobi County doesn't have access to free reliable COVID testing. In terms of our uh, county having uh, made sure that we have full access to healthcare services during the pandemic period, 50% uh, disagree with that. In terms of the county government uh, making sure that health workers have uh, PPEs that they needed to protect themselves during COVID 19. 48% disagreed with it, saying no, they haven't provided that. 
a general statement on the, on the satisfaction of the county government's response to COVID-19. 54 percent said uh, uh, they disagree that uh, Nairobi County has performed well in terms of uh, response to COVID-19. So in terms of citizens' awareness on public uh, participation during the uh, pandemic period, 76 percent said no, that they are not aware of any public participation announced by the county during the pandemic period. Specifically on this question, we wanted to know if they are aware of any public participation that was announced to start COVID-19 funds. So uh, the responses are there, 76% said no, 24% said they are aware of that. And of those who uh, said yes, we asked them, did you attend to that public participation? So 24% of those who uh, said uh, uh, they are aware of public participation, that's about 2% of all those we interviewed. So you can see uh, the percentage uh, percent is very low in terms of uh, citizens who get to attend uh, public participation. So it's a, it's, a, it's a major call on our CSOs to engage citizens and enhance uh, their, their capacity building in terms of extending our public participation. In terms of citizens' awareness on tenders announced by the county related to COVID-19, 89% said they are not aware of any tender that was announced by, COVID uh, by Nairobi County on COVID-19, 11% uh, said yes. And we asked them, so, where can you access information on tenders announced by Nairobi County? Or how is it did to access this information? Uh, a massive number, that's 42% said it's not easy. 25% uh, say that the information is not even accessible. And 28% say they are not aware where to access this information. So only 5% say that it's easy to access information on tenders and payment. So the main concerns around the around utilization of funds, 43% say that the, the support are the COVID-19 uh, response fund. The support that it was intended to provide hasn't reached the target beneficiaries. 36% said that they, they might be misappropriation of funds uh, on COVID-19 through regular procurement. 17% said that there is lack of information around COVID-19 response fund, and 5% aired uh, out other concerns. So we also captured their voices around uh, uh, around the COVID-19 uh, response funds, and some of them stated that it's at a high time we stop corruption and misappropriation of funds meant to respond to, uh, to the pandemic. So they should hold uh, COVID-19 criminals accountable and face penalty for misappropriation of funds. Have better health facilities uh, even at the county level to be able to deal with such sentences. So in summary, uh, we noted that there have been a lot of efforts to create awareness around COVID-19 funds by the government, but that's not all. That's not the only important thing that the government is doing in terms of responding to the, uh, to the pandemic. But they should also play a critical role in ensuring that uh, uh, the inclusion of the citizens in terms of uh, economic disruptions created by the pandemic. And uh, they should also uh, play an important role in ensuring that uh, the vulnerable members in the community uh, the elderly are given uh, a good support during the pandemic. So uh, this, they should also create uh, platforms for citizen uh, participation so that uh, citizens can be able to really uh, monitor and track the utilization of any fund, any public fund that is there, not only the COVID-19 fund. And to create that level of satisfaction from the citizens, the counties will also uh, on a regular basis, create a platform where they get information from the citizens around their concerns. So our recommendations, and uh, most of them have been captured well on the report, is that the government has a critical role, uh, the government institutions have a critical role in monitoring and tracking public funds. So we have a uh, uh, in, uh, independent bodies within the government, like Auditor General, who should be able to support citizens in terms of uh, tracking uh, any, any funds. And uh, it's a pity that uh, if you watch the news yesterday, you noted even uh, some errors from uh, the Auditor General reports on uh, the cancer standard. So 
we need as a citizens to be able to engage different uh, platforms on how uh, public funds need to be used. Uh, the county assemblies also play a very critical role in terms of oversight. And we as CSOs will also build the capacity of uh, uh, county assemblies to be able to perform the role in safety. Uh, there's need for access to information and there's need for deliberate action by the government to enhance access to information by the citizen. Uh, CSOs we have an important role also to create awareness of citizen participation and uh, to engage different citizens and uh, uh, create that uh, interest for them to be able to uh, participate in governance process. So uh, I think that uh, basically the overview of uh, overview of uh, what the report entails. Uh, I'm going to invite uh, my colleague uh, from uh, Development Gateways. They are the guys who develop the open uh, uh, open contracting uh, platform for Makwini County, uh, so that they can also be able to uh, tell us uh, what uh, impact that the Makwini County had when and how, what was their engagement with Makwini County in terms of these platforms. What advantage does the platform have? So, uh, yeah, you can welcome. Uh, so, that's uh, all for me. Thank you so much. Afternoon. Good morning, afternoon. It's 10 minutes of afternoon. How are you all? Great. So, my name is uh, Shadi Mikwe. I am a senior consultant with an INGO called Development Gateway. Um, since I only have 15 minutes, I won't go into who really are. But we are an INGO focused more on digital pollution. We work with governments around the world, our headquarters in DC, uh, to support them in um, improving the use of their data for transparency and affordability. So I think quickly, I will just go through introduction of our understanding of um, open contracting, go through what McQueen County did, and then think about moving forward. If, if we have, I know we have a few counties here, we have a few CSOs, um, if you're interested in, in, in um, implementing an IT solution in relation to open contracting and how you can do that, um, and then I'll leave my contacts in case anyone has other questions in the future. So, um, quickly, so for open contracting and experience, and by our experience, I mean we've done assessments globally, we've engaged governments on um, what open contracting is and how it could be useful to them. One of our key findings is Open contracting is more than just disclosure of data, um, as most people think it's of it as. Um, governments should be doing more, uh, that I'll give you the example that McQueenie did, to ensure there's participation around that data. So meaning uh, all stakeholders, media, civil society, uh, private sector, uh, using your data, what's the uptake of your data, and can you actually show use cases of uh, maybe a CSO having that data to help the county um, find blockages in the procurement processes or find issues in the project um, implementation. So open contracting um, data is three key ones, open, accessible, and timely. So what does that mean? Um, it can be freely used, but of course the county can charge to get the data. Um, any CSO, any media, or anyone can reuse the data and redistribute, and it's actually encouraged to redistribute and reuse the data. Uh, to, of course, hold the government accountable. Um, and this can be, uh, and, and with that, you see different conversations come up based on the data that's published. So what's usually included, and this is an excerpt from the Open Contracting Partnership that supports the Open Contracting Community in coming up with standards. Um, it can include all the way from planning to implementation. So uh, documents such as procurement plans, uh, documents such as tenders, which we all have access to, awards, or data, um, contracts, 
and also um, implementation. So I'll give you an example of Makweni, where they have project management committee, and these project management committees are made up of community members, uh, different PSO members, and these communities come up with a PMC report, and no uh, supplier in Makweni can be paid until that PMC report says we are okay with uh, this project, go ahead and uh, pay the supplier. But in actual sense, for the PMC members to make a good PMC report, they need access to BQ. See, who here has seen a BQ before? Has anyone seen a BQ? No, right? So there are some technical documents that uh, need to be availed to the, to the public. There are some documents that if I, for example, uh, I grew up in Matapia, so I'm from Kajanu. Um, if I want to know what are the projects that are being implemented in my area, for me to know what's supposed to have been done, I definitely need access to some of the contract documents, the milestones that were defined, and also more information on what the project is supposed to achieve. So if I dig, deep, dig deeper into Makweni, um, and I'll take this from an MOU that we had with them, some of the objectives and motivations uh, that came directly from the governor himself, and these are some of the use cases we've seen globally, are they wanted to uh, adopt open contracting to ensure they can support delivery of higher quality goods, work, and services through better use of procurement data and enhanced citizen feedback. So um, the rationale here is internally, as a government, I, we want to know, okay, we're implementing these schools, we're doing this. Are they actually uh, being used by community? Are they creating the correct impact that they should be having? And to do that, it's better to have feedback from uh, citizens. So how do you ensure a pipeline, an easy way, for citizens to communicate to you, and I'll show you what Mapeni did on that. Of course, the famous one that we've already discussed, detecting fraud and corruption risk in public procurement, um, fair competition on a level playing field for businesses in Mapeni County, um, you know, engagements with private sector there. They confirmed that um, they need to see procurement plans. What are the counties trying to procure? What are the counties' strategic uh, documents, such as CIP? That they can align to, to provide the goods necessary and services for the community for the county to achieve those goals and of course better money for money as i said um internally we saw uh the government themselves so the need to compare pricing of goods i think we had a discussion with the team here of how do you know that you're getting value for money as a government across departments so can you be able to see for example pens or stuff that bought across departments or services are we buying them at the correct uh, price? And has even another department found the same value for the product uh, at, at the correct uh, price? So I will try not to be as technical, but what did uh, what did McQueenie implement? Uh, all procurement officers currently in McQueenie have access to a backend system uh, via web a web portal, uh, where they add data from procurement plan all the way to implementation data. So uh, I mean procurement plans, uh, cabinet papers, purchase requisitions, um, professional opinion, awards, all the data, contracts. And now they're starting to add data on administrator reports, MNE reports from the county, uh, the PMC report I spoke about and payment vouchers. Uh, once that data is added, for accountability, once a procurement officer adds the data, a chief officer validates the data. And that's obvious because a chief officer is an accounting officer. Um, so there needs to be a data quality and validation check. That's a big box in all data. Um, then from there, uh, we built an engine for them um, that converts the data to OCDS. Who here has heard of OCDS? The team? Anyone, do you know what OCDS is? Maybe you could explain to the crowd so they don't get bored of my voice. They hear another voice. Sorry? Yeah. So it's a, it's a data standard. So data standard just means um, and we hope that other counties will adopt open contracting. If all the counties publish data with this standard, meaning Nairobi County, Makweni, Algeo, we'll be able to compare data across the counties and even have 
learning events together where they can learn from each other. So a data standard just means that you're standardizing the data. You'd even find in some counties, uh, one department, for example, health, is storing data in a different standard compared to um, which are the departments of health? Youth, yes. So uh, a data standard allows for comparability and interoperability of data so that you can use the data uh, across departments, compare data, and that makes the data more uh, useful. Um, of course, you can see down there, there's a desire to integrate with the PPIP, that's standard.geo.ke, and other national government uh, systems. A few of us, EVOS, TI, uh, Department Gateway, we've been engaging PPRA, uh, NOCP, on adopting open contracting, and I think that would be the most ideal situation because if they adopt it, and if you have uh, procurement systems such as IFMIS and the new EGP system that they're developing, being able to adopt open contracting and publish in, in the OCDS standard, then counties can easily integrate their system uh, to these portals and it's easier for them uh, to document that data and use that data. Um, so they put in all this data. What happened? We have backend analysis that allows to have one, an m &E dashboard, which is public. So I'll, sh I'll share with you the link. And you can see different charts, such as the percentage of projects that go to ACPO, uh, it shows you maybe the timeline of how long your projects are taking, what, what projects are the county mostly tendering for. So you'd find maybe, uh, are the county spending more on road construction, etc. Or you'd find there are some other analytics, which I'll show you. It shows the distribution of tenders across the different wards or sub-counties. And people can start lobbying for more of particular tenders or projects to be budgeted up. Um, the last one is a corruption risk dashboard. Uh, we've always wanted it to be public, but counties prefer it to be uh, an internal dashboard. Uh, reason being, um, a corruption risk dashboard um, uses an international flagging standard that allows you to flag cases of potential uh, corruption. So, uh, a CEC in Makoni right now, uh, on their email, if a procurement of puts in data and it shows, for example, I think someone said the tender is the tender period was shorter than the legal tender period, right? You'll get a flag and say this project in your department is a um, short bit period. You need to check on it. So you understand why it's difficult for them to uh, publish this data because it's a potential risk. But there may be justifications for why uh, the, the period was short or something like that. Yeah. Uh, this is the homepage. Um, as you can see, it just publishes all the tenders, information. I don't have time to show you everything, but I would encourage you to go to opencontracting.makweni.go.ke. It's currently public. Um, I've just talked to you about the public portal. Uh, we have, so we, we, we developed this in stages. <clears throat> um, and I would say, it was based on the needs of the county. So first, the need was to publish procurement to contracting data, but then they realized that it would be more useful to, to also add on implementation data. After they, we added on the implementation data, there's a realization from the county that we don't, some people don't have access to internet in Makweni. So we developed an SMS system where if you dial star eight three star three, a person can subscribe to get alerts on implementation of projects in their sub-county or what? Any report in the county says a report that says, no, no, we think this is satisfactory. They get a, a, a lot on that. And they usually have a lot of bazaar, bazaars where they have these discussions. The county already has the data on what these reports are actually uh, saying. There's also the PMC application. Another uh, concern, of course, because of internet access was uh, PMCs don't always have laptops or they don't always have internet access to update. So imagine when the community were sitting together and then uh, we're called Mashinani. And now we have to evaluate the projects. You go on the ground, wherever you're going, maybe where you built a borehole, there's no internet access, but you have to give a report there and then. So there's an offline app 
um, where you can just put in your notes as a PMC member. And when, when you get back to internet access, it's, it's uploaded to the, the system. Um, so I'll quickly go through. Okay, so why, what have we seen in McQueen and how has it helped? Or what are the CSOs and other stakeholders outside the county, county thing about the portals? Um, one, it really helps with the planning phases. So citizens and community groups can engage in consultation in the planning phase of public procurement and spending processes to meet their needs and concerns. What has been most useful, this is uh, the example of the map, where you can see, you can look at the different number of projects. If you click on one of those bubbles, you'll be able to see the detail. Or priority region. So some people may think that some of the regions are not of a priority in the last fiscal year. What can be done to lobby for more work in your region? Um, of course, ACWA has been such a key issue amongst our work at CSOs and NGOs, but now you cannot be able to have the data on the percentage of projects that are going to each of the target groups and have a basis for engagement or on um, should youth, more youth be getting uh, more projects and what needs to be done and what are the type of tenders that the youth are getting. Value for money, I think I've spoken to about in length. So it's about uh, comparison of prices across departments, across counties, section of fraud. Um, so this is an analytics tool that I'm happy to show any stakeholder here who wants a demo. I'll be happy to show you. It's an open source solution that we're happy to engage with you to use it as a plugin tool. Uh, improved the competition for public contracts. We've also spoken about uh, one that came from LGO. So we've just signed an, an MOU with LGO and we're hoping to launch the open contracting portal there in April. Um, one was the number of tenders awarded to a contractor. Most of them wanted to know across departments are we are we giving contractor a most of the of most of the contracts why is it because they are the only ones with their own capacity so generally as a county being able to be more competitive in how you work this one is a key one that we've seen so uh, as we engage uh, CSOs um, and that it builds a sense of ownership of all contracts and improving trust between county departments uh, and citizens because the communities can access the data and we will also reduce the level of effort spent for committees to come to offices to access and question tender implementation uh, processes. Uh, citizen monitoring, I think I've spoken to you about that. Uh, some of the document projects to know what payments have been done so far to hold suppliers accountable for, for paid services. Uh, promote, this one is a key one where they wanted to promote channels for engaging uh, citizens. So through the PMC reports I've mentioned very many times, road over CR reports, MNE reports, uh, community feedback through digitized feedback mechanisms, and of course helping communities better understand who they know. What are the examples that have been given? The governor stated that after analysis of data published by the county, the road department learned that more open bids often lead to lower prices and run more open competition tenders. And when they did analysis, analysis they estimated it saved them 30 million shillings in that last fiscal year. I know you all know Uraya. Uh, they used the data and identified 35 delayed projects in the data published and worked to government to, get, uh, to engage them on how to make the project go back on track. So to hold the government accountable. So if you want to adopt open contracting, what would be the steps? This is the typical steps that we follow. Uh, we usually carry out an assessment, but I can see Nairobi already has a head start. They already have a, a bit of data on what was done with Wajibika. Uh, we could carry out an assessment, we interview departments, CSO, media supplier, um, identify several uses in these cases. But it is a technical assessment to see how best to uh, implement the system in, in, your, in your county or organization. Reason being, I'll give you an example. With Makweni and Elgeo, we see different needs. We see McQueen wanted to publish everything, LKO didn't want to publish it, which is fair. A county may have different uh, priorities in what they want to publish, depending on how they engage their stakeholders. After the assessment, we usually have an MOU, which is uh, the standard norm of working. Um, well, we commit to supporting the county finding funds to, to implement. So we have a team of technical developers. Of course, we need to be paid. But if a county, of course, most of the time, um, these projects are not usually planned for as much as before. Uh, we can support in developing the system for free and finding other stakeholders to, 
to um, fund the project. Um, then we, we do the technical development and we hand over and launch the system. By hand over, I'll give you an example. I don't have access to the Mapuni system anymore. We completely hand over. The data is posted by the county themselves. And as an organization, we don't have any access to that data. Um, <clears throat> lastly, I just wanted to emphasize um, that the open contracting, I know we, emphasize, we talk a lot about the system itself. But in our approach, we go beyond the technology. Um, with first ensuring buying CCPOs, uh, CCs, chief officers, procurement officers, and other county officials. Reason being, open contracting as a concept needs to be established as a county as a whole. It's not something that just can be owned by finance department, uh, by ICT. So we do intense training of CCs. We do, uh, that's why we, we also follow the MOU approach. We do in intense commitments with uh, all the, the whole cabinet to make sure there's buy-in across all departments. Uh, in Makwendi, we worked with Hibos where they developed an open contracting policy, which, which can help with the sustainability of the system. So what will govern the use of the system past the ambassadors that we have? For example, in Makwendi, we all know Kibuda is running for other, other posts. How, what will happen after he leaves Makwendi? Is the system going to still be sustainable in the county? Uh, reporting mechanisms for citizens is important. It goes back to the, my first point on open contracting, not just about publishing data, but ensuring the use of the data. So if you look at the portal, you can easily leave comments uh, on the portal. In the SMS system, I told you, you can send SMS feedback. Um, what else do they have? You can subscribe to receiving updates on some of the data that they have. Um, Back to helping communities understand BQs and other gender documents, um, to intense training of communities and CSOs of how they can continue holding the government accountable. Lastly, they, we cannot emphasize the importance of media and CSOs to ensure uh, the use of data. So with that, I think I'm done. Do I open up for questions? Yes. Yeah. I would say in Makweni, our timeline for implementation, we're still there. But I would say be between start and launch, if the system can be built, can be implemented in even three months, right? Most of the time goes into training, engagement, etc. Um, one of our biggest lessons learned is to create uh, buy-in and um, adoption by county officials is also pitching it through what is the value, in, what is the value for them. For example, our counties have a lot of reporting mandates. Um, one value we've seen is once they streamline their data, they can be able to even report their ACPO uh, requirements as faster than possible and uh, send it up to national government. That's one. Number two, um, counties have been trying to, this is what we have been told by county, to build trust with their citizens. Uh, one other pitch that we give them is how are we able to build trust and co with communities and citizens. I think open contracting is not that it's a watchdog <laughs> that is just trying to look down on you and, and hold you accountable all the time, right? We can shift and trust with citizens in an era in Kenya, which honestly, we're having challenges with trusting our government um, institutions. So realizing that publishing data at first doesn't fault you, but it helps people even trust you more. 
but that's a good question because maybe if you have ideas, you can also tell us. One of the key things that we are struggling with is uh, buying from counties. We would have been extended to 10, 15 if we wanted to. But for us, our approach has to be establish buying first and uh, implement the solution. Oh, sorry, you had another question. <laughs> ah, so, um, as you know, the EGP strategy, yeah? uh, when was it launched last year? Uh, late last year, right? The EGP strategy. So we're just trying to align ourselves. As you can see, national government is also trying to address a few issues with IFMIS and the EGP strategy. So I would say it's a more long-term uh, conversation with, in terms of IFMIS and the EGP strategy, but with PPRA, they confirmed their willingness to adopt open contracting, and that's a, a conversation that uh, through the PPIP in terms of the GO.K portal, that's a conversation that's still ongoing with uh, civil society. Yes. on counties um, it's much easier to get the buying that you're talking about at the county level and implementation is much the turnaround is much faster so i think our, our objective for the first few years is to do a pilot a proof of concept uh through makweni and other counties because through that you can say we have done this uh in the county level and level it up because every time we got national government of course their first reaction is would this work in in kenya but the fact that it's been able to be implemented in Makwenya and they're moving to other counties, we hope this will prove a, a proof of concept to the national government. In terms of official partnerships, no official partnership with national government, just official engagements with uh, uh, PPRA, as I said. In terms of how can we implement open contracting, what to open up their data for counties to know. Actually, one of the motivations for Makweni was because they were not able to access their data and use it for analytics through PPRT. If they open up that data, these are conversations, and we found it easier to work with the counties uh, to engage national government. So, for example, Makweni County has also been engaging in official co capacity with the, uh, the IFNIS team and PPRA as government to government to encourage them to open up the data, which is much, much easier, and we think with NGO coming out outside the government sphere. So working together with all the governments as a, as a team, sort of just part of the NGO, engaging in the other question was, sorry, COVID. COVID. Oh, so uh, one, I think we would have been able to flag cases of corruption uh, much earlier, of course, with uh, opened up data. We try to engage national government on that issue. And I said the issue is uh, buy-in, but we saw, uh, a key step forward with them publishing some of the contracts that KEMSA was uh, given out to so the KEMSA website. They've already published uh, some of that data. But I think we would have been able to provide solutions, data solutions, and with a quick around time, because the, the system is already there, would have quickly plugged and played with KEMSA or any other institution to have them adopt the system. Uh, we monitor the data themselves, even internally, to see different trends of corruption and even Black and address those issues as soon as possible.
But for us, it's more that engagement towards building each other and creating systems that we create that favorable environment for the world. I, I attest to it that no one wants corruption to happen within the party. So we are trying together as stakeholders, as CSOs, as stakeholders, as individuals, to work together with the government so that the citizens can be able to create value for money and paper services. Uh, any more questions? With that said and done, I'd like to invite uh, Miriam for our presentation. Okay, start the youth agenda. Uh, I would like to start by appreciating everyone who made a presentation and for each of you coming today to for the lunch of what you um i'd also like to request um that everybody signs in so that you have the right data uh for our reporting i'm not sure where the sign up sheet is uh it's Yes, please pass it around so that everyone who come after can sign in. Um, so, uh, under plenary, I'd like to open the discussion. I would like to open the floor for further discussion. So, as we're launching the report today, how can we build advocacy around open contracting and accountability in our county? So, that's the discussion I'd like us to have. And any room for partnership will be highly appreciated. So I don't know who will be on my team passing around the mic. But let's start off. How do you build advocacy around ensuring accountability in our county? Anyone?
no longer exist. So when Athena is preserved for you, let it just be for you. For women, because when you mix the three groups together, the use of nothing to be familiar. It is advantage. All the others, actually all the others in our life, most of them are taken. Okay, women are 90%. It's a plan. So when you say that two women are part of the stability, then you are disadvantaging the youth and all the part of the stability. So that is also a place that I wish to emphasize and encourage the other things. Another thing, my sister here talked about finance. Who says that the youth cannot do a gender for the same thing? Okay, what is especially encouraging that they can find. But at the end of the day, what should be looked is that is that money or is that payment going to the youth account? Are we together? So any gender, any youth can participate. But at the end of the day, let the payment be done on that person's account. Here comes the problem. Somebody is paying. At the end of the day, you're not sorry. So it also brings a challenge that somebody somewhere wants to uplift the youth. But once the money keeps the account, excuse me, please. Another. Excuse me, please, sir. Allow me, you would actually spoken and you're still going on. So please, one minute uh, to interrupt you. I wish to introduce our board director of the youth agenda. Uh, Martin, please, if you don't mind, she will let you the evening. I have to just give us a minute to represent uh, the board. Yes, please come over. Then from there, after she finishes, we will uh, kindly ask you that we proceed uh, to officially cut the ribbon because time is not on our side and uh, everybody wants to catch. The next meeting. She had some time. Oh. <laughs> yes. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Are we tired? Do we feel want to stand and stretch? But based on the engagements as I was sitting behind there, you don't sound tired. Yeah. So I don't know whether I should remove this and speak or you want me to cover my whichever way. Okay. So my name is Marcin Duko. I'm not a youth, <laughs> but uh, I'm a friend of young people, having started as a young person and a co-founder of the Youth Agenda. I currently sit in the board for a specific period of time um, to do certain things. So mine is very brief. Sorry, I didn't want to interrupt the gentleman sharing. You're sharing very important um, information. We need insider information from such institutions so that youth can also be able to uh, demystify some of these institutions where we hear the opportunities for young people, but how do they get them? Those are the same questions you were asking yourself when we started the organization. How will we participate in the policy making and political processes of if we are not, we do not have the inside uh, story of it or the, the experiences. So there's a lot of engagement that had to be done between different stakeholders, including the players. So the same thing runs across in the same, in the sense that um, just coming from what you're sharing, that we need to have a very good uh, understanding of what's happening inside the, these institutions. But let me start, first of all, by appreciating the work that has gone into this project, the Wachibika. Uh, a lot has been done, and not only by, by my um, colleagues at Youth Agenda, but by the various partners. Thank you, UNDP, for coming to partner on such a very critical uh, project. But also the various players, uh, as I was listening, I was hearing different uh, uh, organizations that have been part and parcel of this process and other related process that are working towards um, empowering, uh, equipping, 
young people to participate in these processes, including the open contracting and the specific um, area of research that was done um, uh, as Edina was able to present. Very interesting about this open contracting and uh, the presentation by the lady on McQueney County. I happen to come from McQueney County, so I can share some, with you some of the feedback I've also experienced on the ground. But just generally seeing what such steps can do in terms of unlocking the opportunities um, that young people are daily looking for. But also, and this was probably, as I was seeing time running, I was trying to say, should I put my hand up and also make a, a, a contribution to this, that um, um, the whole process that she presented it, all the way from planning, you know, I kept on asking myself, yes, we want to see how we can, you know, integrate or, or mainstream young people into these processes. Um, but it starts right from the beginning. The structures that put together the development plans for that particular county, are they those that are meant to accelerate or initiate, uh, you know, development programs that are aimed at equipping these young people who we are saying now are not economically empowered to be able to participate competitively in some of these procurement or contracting processes. Uh, the PMC, she was saying, or the other community um, audiences where you are receiving feedback from the community players and the decision makers on what projects should take what priorities. At, the, at that very basic level, we need to start being felt there. Because the moment we do so, then we are able to uh, input into the process of what key programs on development projects need to go into place that will benefit more young people and other um, marginalized groups. And therefore, when it comes now to the process of planning and deployment of the resources, like the budgetary allocations, you're already taken care of. I hope you see the way I'm coming from. You know, uh, when it comes, you know, we used to be told, um, especially when we got into the devolution and the county government, and we'd keep on complaining and asking, how comes the roads within our neighborhoods and the, the, the water supply within our neighborhoods, well, how comes these things are still not being taken care of? And then we'd be asked questions when the the nominations of whoever was going to be the MCA or other um, county uh, leaders, where were we as young people? How did we impact or influence in terms of prioritizing the people who we know clearly have the agenda of development in those areas? So we see people eventually on ballot papers and we usher them in because you know how we vote. Eh? And then subsequently we start complaining again. Where would we have made more impact? Starting at the grassroots level, where you're identifying the people who should be your voice when it comes to, you know, um, electing people into office. So similarly, for me, I felt that's where it needs to start. So that when I'm saying I need to see more young people um, uh, being pre-qualified uh, to provide these various services, What's, who decided what services need to be provided or which program or which development agenda need to be put in place? They need also to have been there so that as that goes, it's a cyclical process, the more opportunities are being unlocked for young people to be able to participate. But I'm not here to give a presentation. Mine was just to appreciate all uh, that were involved in this process. I see it gaining another life, continuing evolving and opening more uh, uh, doors for engagement with other players. We are very much uh, open and we welcome um, together with um, you know, my colleagues at Youth Agenda, we are welcome to engage further to see how we can open this to be a nationwide conversation. Nairobi was just a start. I'm seeing this probably rolling out to other counties so that then we can be able to have a bigger national voice of how we need to participate in these processes. So again, all the supporters, the partners, we thank you. We appreciate. Please forgive us where well there could have been lapses. Yeah, and also um, let's continue equipping each other and uh, empowering each other with this kind of information so that we have more young people coming to participate in such forums. To sit in a forum where you're hearing about open contract in such detail, I really appreciate that I can imagine how many more people would have wanted to hear this. So there's more room for engagement in the future.
So once again, thank you so much. Thank you, Kia, for giving me the ambush. I'm just rushing to another meeting at one, but I thought it would be nice for me to come and just sit and receive part of the, the findings from the research. Edin, thank you. That's a wonderful job. Thank you very much. That's how we now want to go to the launch of the report. We have taken note of the recommendations and the possible way forward, some that have been highlighted in our report, and that uh, will be you know, putting them together so that we make a report at the end of the day. There are also discussions that were going on, which we appreciate, and I uh, think also after the launch, there will still be room for uh, discussion and to register uh, information for further uh, consideration. Our brother from the procurement, uh, it's unfortunate that probably we did not reach you specifically, but your director of procurement has been working with us all through and even part of the team can confirm, including Banawainaina here who works at the uh, county government. So it's now my humble ado to invite our partner, presented by John Mall and Then I will also invite Banawainaina and I will invite uh, Antinuku now that she's still here. Yes, Banawainaina, you are be here. Our sister from Gates, uh, will also be in the tunnel. What is going to move? Yes, I'm going to be the tunnel. And uh, there is the thing here from the level. I need to be a bit ready uh, today. We have uh, a potato from a uh, point or the yeah, guy, one of them. Yeah, many titles. What do you mean? This is not a big one. Such a boy. Thank you. 